and uh, internships coordinator. Hello, Tamara. Hello, hello. And Hi. Video. Hi. How's it going? Um, yeah. So I'm going to hand over to you for this great um, next part of our open day. So there we go. Thanks, Julia. Welcome, everybody. It's great to have you all with us. Before I introduce our industry guests, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm presenting on the land of the Gadigal and Biribirigal people, the traditional custodians of this land. We pay our respects to elders, past, present and emerging, and acknowledge the Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who are with us today. Welcome. So firstly, thank you everyone for joining. Um, you've had a big, amazing day watching really cool live demos and meeting some of our wonderful educators and graduates and the fantastic AIT support staff. So um, welcome to all of you who just joined in now. So you're in for a real treat. You're going to meet four leading practitioners from animation, film and video, VFX and games industries who'll give us some great insights into their fields of expertise. So I'll introduce each of our guests with their incredible bios, which are so impressive. And we'll start with Jackie Trow. Are you there, Jackie? Do you wanna turn your camera on? There she is. Hey, Tamara, how are you going? Hi, hi, she's given us a wave. So Jackie is an award-winning animation director, having directed hundreds of productions in all animation media. A highlight for her was being nominated for a Golden Bear at the Berlin Biennale for the highly acclaimed Beyond Freedom. Jackie's agency clients include Ogilvy and Matha, Leo Burnett, Saatchi and Saatchi, Sesame Workshop, UNICEF, to name just a few. Jackie's uh, variety of visual style comes from her collaborative approach to filmmaking and all of her productions have a fresh, unique and exciting quality. So Jackie's currently um, working as an animation director for one of Australia's leading animation studios, Flying Bark Productions, and uh, on such series such as 100% Wolf, Legend of Moonstone. Welcome, Legend, Jackie Trail. <laughs> And now to introduce April Howard, if April, you want to turn on your camera and give a wave. There she is. So April is a film producer and founding partner of Rolling Ball Productions, an award-winning creative communication and independent film production company. So April's career began as an actor, appearing in a number of TV series, including Blue Healers, Man from Snowy River and Snowy, just to name a few. So she left to acting in the late 90s to study business and journalism and then jo joined Network 7 as a reporter before founding Rolling Ball, Ro sorry, before founding Rolling Ball Productions in the mid 2000s. April produced the social impact short film Catching Dragonflies and is currently developing a slate of long format projects, so feature films and TV series. She's also studying for Masters in Screen Arts, Business and Leadership at Afters. Thanks for being with us today, April. Okay, next we have Mark Miller. So if Mark, you can turn on your camera and give us a wave. He's here somewhere. I'm sure he'll come on in. He'll find the little button to join. There he is. Hey, Mark. Hi. So our Business Development uh, Manager, Mark Miller, came to Alt BFX via a career in journalism, marketing and media production in the UK. So having worked with animation giants Animal Logic on Lego Batman, Avengers Age of Ultron and more, he moved to Alt in 2015, helping to lift the profile of the company uh, internationally and assisting on the next few years of financial growth. Mark's been key in the company's move into film and television working on projects such as Jane Campion's feature film, The Power of the Dog, and Australian uh, films such as Little Monsters and Penguin Bloom, alongside multiple episodic series, including Nine Perfect Strangers and the forthcoming Netflix series, Pieces of Her. Mark is also leading Alt's emerging technology business and uh, creates innovative uh, work in the uh, AR, VR and real-time interactive spaces. Great, you could join us today, Mark. 
Last and definitely not least is Chris Murphy, who is an evangelist for Epic Games and director of Pub Games. With over 10 years of experience using Unreal Engine, a Bachelor of Computer Science and a Bachelor of Multimedia, Chris has a broad skill set across a range of game development disciplines. So Chris's game development credits extend across PC, PS4, iOS and Android. Most recently, Chris has worked with uh, Pub Games to release Primal Carnage Extinction for PC and PS4. Chris's role as evangelist for Epic Games is to help independent VR developers build successful games with Unreal Engine 4 through support, training and education. So Chris will be sharing some of the latest developments from Unreal Engine tools in the VR space. Welcome, Chris. There you are. Happy to be here. Great to see you. So, wow, um, what amazing careers you've all had today uh, and with such diversity um, um, amongst your careers. And now I'd sort of like to go back a bit in, in time, your creative journeys and where it all started, those early days and inspirations. And I might start with you, Jackie. So, yeah. Um, yeah, can you describe the arc of uh, your career journey as a, an emerging talent to where you are today, one of Australia's leading 2D and 3D animation directors? Um, thanks, Tamara. Um, yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> um, I kind of actually started my career in in uh, live action. I was actually, well, I didn't start my animation career in live action, I, but it, that's how it started. Um, I was uh, um, actually an art director in um, live action, working on a few sort of short films and and um, and commercials and stuff like that. And I came across a, um, I worked on a commercial that was both live action and claymation. And I just absolutely fell in love with the claymation side. I was kind of like almost not 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 taking care of my live action duties that well. I was so focused on what was happening with the claymation, I just wanted to do it, you know. And um, I ended up yeah, starting. I'm sorry. What's that? I just wanted you to describe um, a claymation. Um, yep. Can you give us an example so um, the people in the audience know what a, what claymation animation is? An example yep. of one we may have all seen. So um, claymation is uh, probably mostly made famous by Ardman Animation in Bristol, called uh, uh, with their their production of Morph. It was probably the, it was, there's lots of other stuff and there was lots of other stuff, but that, that uh, was equally as good. But I think Morph was probably one of those really memorable claymation characters, all one piece of clay and, and, and I interacted with, um, if I remember correctly, like interacted with live action people as well. But it just, so essentially using the, the material plasticine, uh, building characters. And the, the fabulous thing about it is that you can, you re-sculpt. So you any, anything stop motion, you're animating a character in front of a camera. There's no real computers involved. There's a, there's a bit of a computer assist these days, but most of all, you are actually moving a puppet frame by frame in front of a camera recording frame, frame, frame. And what's beautiful about claymation is that it's so sculptable. So you're not, um, you're, you're completely changing the character or whatever you animating at the time, frame by frame, because you can actually, it's such a malleable, malleable material. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, it was just fascinating and I, I um, I ended up uh, forming a company with him called XY Zoo Animation in Cape Town. And uh, we had that for a while. And um, Lindsay, my partner, was very much a claymation purist, but I became more interested in all things stop motion. So I ended up um, starting my own business, um, a, new, a new studio called Triggerfish Animation, which actually still exists as a, as a 3D animation studio now. Um, and uh, we explored all sorts of things in stop motion and had a fanta fantastic time doing it, had a wonderful studio. Obviously 3D was like, you know, talking about a while ago, <laughs> uh, 3D was like sort of becoming better and better and better. You know, in the old days, 3D, we had a look at, if you remember the first, fo uh, first um, uh, Toy Story film, kind of looked at the human characters and went, oh my God, <laughs> you know, but it's come so far since then. And as it, as it, as it sort of gained ground as something much more popular, especially in the commercial industry as well, not just um, long form, um, uh, there became less and less of a demand, a commercial demand for stop motion. So it became much more, much more of a niche art for me. So uh, I still absolutely love it and do it when I can. Um, but after that, I sort of, yeah, I sort of became more of an ind independent director working with 
um, animators in all disciplines, which I really enjoyed. So it sort of really expanded my, my knowledge of all the different animation disciplines. Um, and yeah, that sort of took me, I guess, to where I'm at right now. And I've, um, I'm now directing um, 3D series. I'm a series director at Flying Bark for their, um, and been working on recently 100% Wolf TV, which is kind of comes from the movie that they made about the same thing. Exactly, and I know that you're going to be presenting your work at the upcoming AEAF, which is really, really exciting. Maybe you can come to AIT and present your work as well. Yeah, um, for sure. To our students. We love inspiring uh, our students by showcasing the work of industry practitioners such as yourselves. It's just uh, such a boost for our students. Um, they, love, they love the work of practitioners. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, April. Um, look, we'd like to know where you were at when you finished high school, not that long ago, and what led you to your current career? Okay, thank you for having me, Tamara. Um, oh, look, many roads lead to Rome is probably one of the summaries, um, uh, summary points in the fact that being asked to sort of come here today made me reflect on the journey and... Really, I guess it started out at one step before the end of high school where I did work on um, sets of different series um, in regional Victoria, uh, sort of fairly well-known, you know, television drama. Um, I was thrown into that as an extra and then ended up getting sort of bit parts and more significant parts. And then it all got a little bit too scary when I was getting offered jobs that meant I was going to have to leave um, my home and move to Sydney. So I decided then to call it stumps with acting and um, to just focus on finishing school. And then because I was a little bit young and from a regional part of Australia, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So I did business just to have a foundation of something. But what I would say is when it comes to being a creative person, like my family group is very much based in the arts and I don't think you can avoid finding your way home, if that makes sense. And through different steps, I ended up deciding that screen was definitely going to still be my medium and that journalism would be a great way to tell real stories and let, um, you know, narratives come to life. So it is a varied sort of journey. But what I would say is that there's always been the screen through line. And I think what I would say is you never stop learning. And one of the big takeaways that I, I remember hearing, and I, you know, probably need to remind myself of it today is if you keep knocking on doors, for example, one will eventually open and that collaborative you know, creative people are generally collaborative people because they are wanting to have work and artwork realised. Um, so I hope that kind of gives you a summary. And then I guess where I'm at now is again, going back to study. So running a production company in Newcastle for the last 10 years, the pandemic made us have a look at everything and myself and I decided to go back to um, a version of uni to study masters um, in screen business to pivot, reinvent and make the most of all the changes that are happening in the landscape at the moment with um, lots of different ways we can make and have content shown. And we've all got our cameras and computers and, um, and phones. So we're all content makers now. Exactly. April, being open um, to anything that comes your way and knocking on those doors re is really what, um, can make opportunities happen. And, and having the confidence and self-belief, I think helps. You started uh, a professional career very young. I suppose that's that's helped you a little bit, but. Um... It has. Um, I think the other thing is too, all creators I feel, I don't wanna to make too many generalizations, but you can kind of appear to be one way, but inside there's a different feeling. And if you are you know, not feeling 100% confident or anxious that, just do something, just reach out, make, make a step because soon the little steps add up and you'll look back and go, I've come this far. And particularly when it is creative work, it's a creative expression. So it's very personal sometimes and, you know, you're exposing yourself as well, but, you know, you kind of got to do it and I bet the rewards outweigh that risk. Fantastic. Thanks for sharing that. Amazing. Right. Mark, over to you. So you lead the business development area of BFX. Can, I, can you tell us about what your creative aspirations, what they were that led you to the VFX industry and your current role? Uh, it's funny actually listening to April there because it seems our journeys are actually been quite similar and so similar that I'm also doing the exact same course that April was doing. She's a classmate of mine. Um, I... After high school, I, I was just I was really interested in general creative arts, like from music and filmmaking and 
anything else. But I, I wasn't really sure what which pathway to to go down. And similar to April, I ended up doing journalism because I realised that I could all these people that I admired, whether they be filmmakers or musicians, as a journalist, I could call them up and talk to them and generally interrogate them about, hey, how'd you do this? What was the inspiration behind this? And that I found amazing, amazing joy in that. And I did it for something like 15 years or so. But then as you kind of get older and I moved into a more kind of marketing PR type role where I knew how to tell those stories in, in a different way and make it readable for readers and other editors so that they would then publish stories about the companies I was working for. And that's kind of what led me to come to Australia. Obviously, this isn't an, an Australian, a regional Australian accent. It's quite far regional. Um, I do a very good Australian accent. I do. You know that too, Tamara. I do. Um, and, and then just working for Animal Logic, although hearing you say those the bio back, I feel almost like a charlatan. I didn't I didn't work on those films, but I I I did PR and worked with the production companies to figure out what stories we could tell and putting together the reels and all that sort of stuff. So that really and obviously Animal Logic's huge. So being in that company and learning more about the business and the landscape and all the different disciplines really kind of set me up to go to a, a smaller company and, and over the years kind of affect change. And as, as Jackie said, there's, we were, a, Alt VFX was really just concentrating on visual effects and animation for commercials. But coming from Animal Logic, I was aware of all the incentives and the amount of work that was streaming into Australia. And I knew that there was a real opportunity for the company to grow into that space. And that was about, thankfully, I got to kind of lead that business development end of it now. Um, and that's kind of what I do, just seek new new projects, bring them in the door and then hand them off to the, the, the real talent behind me. Ah, no, you've got a real talent, Mark. Um, it's, it's really important uh, for people who have a broad understanding of creative industry and creative technologies to be in the kinds of positions you're in business development, like you say, you know, you were instrumental in bringing, you know, film, feature film to alt, yep. uh, which is which is extremely important. You're very connected in the industry and that's something else that we, we you know, impress on our students that that is, is really important. And, and actually being at um, a place like IOT, that's where you start your network and, you know, in a quiet way, you're very good at that, Mark, and that's part of the biz. No, well, that's, that's something that we always try and emphasise to the students. As everyone knows, if you're creating something, you, you, you very rarely do it on your own. So it's important to nurture those relationships, nurture those partnerships, nurture the people around you and kind of collaborate with them, yep. and create something cool. Fantastic. Thank you, Mark. Now, Chris, hello. We'd love hello. to hear about your backstory. Yeah, sure. But what, what led uh, you to pursuing a career in games? Yeah, sure. Uh, first, I'm just going to apologise. I actually missed the memo on the, the backgrounds. Uh, my apologies. I actually had yesterday off, and somehow that was one of the, the emails that uh, oh, good. skipped by. So uh, I, uh, my apologies to everyone for that one. No problem. Uh, but with regards to games, um, so my, my backgrounds, like, I mean, I'm... My background's reasonably a, a straight line, to be honest, on this one. Um, like back, uh, back in, honestly, it goes back as far as primary school, I started to mess around with level editors for games, uh, anything I could get my hands on, be it the original Command & Conquer with its rules.ini files or Duke Nukem 3D or Doom or Quake. Um, so I used to kind of make my own levels for games. I used to, uh, you know, um, and I always kind of had this as just a little bit of a hobby. I didn't treat it as a career, to be honest, until I, mean, I didn't even know that it was a career until uh, I happened to see it pop up as a course listing in 2006 when I was graduating. And I thought, why not? 
uh, I went to uh, I went to Swinburne and uh, to their open day at the time. And the person running their course at the time was one of the developers on a game called Team Fortress, uh, which for me at the time was a really big thing because I was like, I'd lost thousands of hours of my life towards that mod. So I was like, yeah, okay, I'm all in. Anyway, long story short, uh, someone said Team Fortress 1 or 2, uh, Quake World Team Fortress. So the original, original uh, Quake. Uh, but uh, so what happened was I kind of started to do that and did start working on the double degree. But as I got towards the end of the double degree, um, I had this really, really strong feeling of like there were there were gaps in my knowledge, I guess. And I, I think this is the case uh, for every every way you may study uh, is that, you know, when you get to the end of your course, your teachers can do their best job in the world. But the truth is, is there's still a lot of stuff that as students, you're always going to be like, I don't know what I don't know. And that's a bit of an uncomfortable feeling when you're like, I have to go do this job. So I started to get together some of the people that I was studying with and we started to build games together because we figured if we built games, we'd work out uh, you know, where, the, where the hiccups were and the problems along the way. Um, and what that resulted in is it kind of snowballed uh, and eventually became starting a company, started making our own games uh, and that was Pub Games. Uh, then about five years ago, uh, I got picked up uh, to handle evangelism for Unreal Engine in Australia, New Zealand, and Southeast Asia by Epic Games. Uh, so my role kind of shifted, and I went from being what's called a technical artist to uh, a more uh, evangelism role is the, uh, the title, um, which sounds like a strange title, but effectively my job these days is I work with uh, game studios, film studios, animation studios. Um, and they send me into studios to kind of fix problems, help out people, uh, work through things. It's a bit of a mixed bag, um, but having someone with my skill set uh, is, is pretty useful because there aren't too many technical artists in Australia. You know, in fact, like there's maybe a couple of dozen. Uh, so it's a, a reasonably small field, but it is also one of those things that adds a lot of polish to a project. Yeah. Uh, so like I said, it was kind of a reasonably straight shot because I kind of went into games and then aggressively moved through games. Um, but I, I do want to highlight that um, there are a lot of folks that do what I did, which is, you know, we, we can sit in these calls and you can discuss career opportunities uh, about ending up in large studios. And that is, you know, that is like definitely a great thing to, to end up in. But um, there are definitely a lot of folks who, after doing their studies, kind of go out on their own for a while to kind of find their place and find what they're good at. Um, in, in, in my situation, it was I went from level design to technical art, um, and it was a really lucky thing. Uh, it wasn't in, intended as a pathway, but it meant that um, I had a lot of value to the, the surrounding games community because of it and helped out a lot of people since. Fantastic. Fantastic, Chris. You know, I was going to ask you a question later about transferable skills. And yeah. you've actually just answered that here and now because what started in games and being an evangelist for this engine, Unreal, you've been able to work with the film industry, the VFX, um, animation. It's it's extraordinary, yeah. really. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, like it's it's really easy to get a bit of an, uh, like a, a, a tight tunnel vision on game development, right? Because you're like, you know, you think of games and you think of like, your your fortnights and your call of duties and whatever else but um truth is at the end of the day you're adding interactivity to a real-time space and because of that that can be anything from architectural visualization to uh you know to animation film and tv it could be helping engineers uh develop something or pre-visualize something before it's constructed um you know pr uh, product visualization it's a pretty wide-reaching field and at the end of the day like the imagery that gets put out of a game like if we want to hit a um you know if you want to hit frame rate you need to get that that image that high quality image out in 33 milliseconds and given that there are quite a few people on the panel here today that have been in the the, the animation space uh 33 milliseconds for an image is is a pretty quick turnaround uh given that you know a classical render classical sorry uh mm -hmm. a, 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 a traditional scanline uh, render sorry uh, is, uh, you know, can, can take hours sometimes. So um, yeah, we, we have to have all sorts of tips and tricks to kind of get through those things. Fantastic. Thanks, Chris. Look, I'm going to um, ask somebody in the chat room, uh, one of our fantastic AIT staff, are there any questions so far for any of the panelists? 
day tomorrow. Yes, yeah. good timing actually. We just had a question um, come through from uh, from from Blake, and he said, uh, "I think this question applies to Mark. I'm not sure, but it revolves around the 3D animation and VFX courses stroke industry. But what companies offer internships?" Uh, I mean, a lot of them do in in their own their different ways. I know RSP do a, a kind of school internship thing. Animal, when I was there, Animal Logic were running a, a kind of roto course, which is for people who are looking to get into the compositing route. I mean, even in the years that I was there, say they had 20 students for a, a six week course. As soon as that course ended, Animal Logic hired something like 18 to 19 of them. It's always one bad apple. No. <laughs> But they all really, that was their first foot in the door. And before they knew it, they had a, a credit on a, a Hollywood film and they were off to the races. And I know even there's the Animal Logic doing a lot of things. I'm sure Jackie can talk about Flying Barks, kind of internship opportunities. And it is a, a really good time for young and emerging students at the moment, because traditionally, the, the larger studios might, even ILM are doing stuff, the, the larger studios might have, when they were expanding to 300, 400 staff, a lot of that local talent would have been augmented by overseas talent flying in from London or, or Canada or, or anywhere else, in fact. But obviously because of COVID, that process has slowed a lot. So in terms of talent, we, we find that all of the companies that are operating operating in this space are kind of fishing from the same shallow talent pool that is here, which is good news for emerging students because there's much more opportunity for them to actually get their foot in the door, I would say. But even the a lot of the, the state agencies in the space and production that are coming to Australia, they, they sponsor opportunities for young artists to come in the door. We, we've just brought on someone in our Brisbane studio that was tied to the, the contract for the Netflix show Pieces of Her. So, and there's, I think Animal Logic took on two people, Cutting Edge took on a, a, a couple of people as well. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really just keeping an eye out and where those opportunities are. Follow, follow people like Jackie and myself on LinkedIn, who whenever those opportunities arise, all of those people really publish them on LinkedIn, on other forums. Yeah, so there's a lot. I feel like there's, now's a good time to be an emerging student. It's a great time, Mark. Um, the, the industries, whether it's game, uh, film, TV, animation, VX, VFX, thriving at the moment, crying out for talent. Mm -hmm. um, Mark will tell you, um, I've been trying to get uh, one of the, some of our students into alt VFX for a while now. It will happen. Um, I'm the person um, who places AIT internships or sources them um, and works with the student to find the best sort of uh, profile match company for their talents. And, you know, we've had a student go to ILM, Industrial Light and Magic. That's George Lucas's company. Um, we'll be in there at um, Alt VFX before too long. Um, look, um, game companies, uh, Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, we've got many of our graduates working there, interning. And of course, at Flying Bark Productions, um, we have a great partnership with them, Jackie, as you know. I think five of our students working there, Liam Newen, Chloe Lamley, um, Joel Serdic, Chesie Thompson, and previously Tristan Sinnott, they all started as interns. Mm -hmm. They're working there full time now. So that's one of the opportunities. But um, great question from, from the audience there. And thank you, Mark, for, for jumping in. Any, any others? Julie? Yeah, there's, there's a couple of really good ones just coming through, actually. Um, uh, Rachel was asking about portfolios um, and particularly what um, are employers looking for in a portfolio or someone new to the field? 
Okay, we were going to get to that a bit later, but why not let's just jump in now. Um, look, how about we start with, with Jackie um, and, and tell us, you know, what you look for in emerging talent when considering taking them on for an internship or, 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 or a junior level role. Yep. I, I have to like really agree with Mark is that it really is um, a good time to be um, getting into the industry. Um, I know just uh, with us crewing up on the second season of Wolf TV at the moment, we are battling with crew. Um, and it is at the moment, look, you know, so the skilled crew is one thing. I mean, as you know, as a student going in and, 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 you're, and starting off your career, you might not fit into that category. But um, I do know that, like, especially at Flying Bark too, you know, if you go in, the, Flying Bark's really um, focused on career paths. So if you get in there as an intern, you know, it might not be that like you, you continue the same way you've always focused, but you might find that your path sort of deviates or goes into something else, which is, and I mean, we all want to be working, right? We, that's that's the reason we do this job. We, we I mean, if we didn't have to earn money, it'd be great because we could do what we wanted, but we do have to work and we do want to be part of the industry. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it's one of those things where you have to go where the work is. So hone your skills to, to what's, what's needed. Um, and um, I, I think that, you know, when, and that's something that you do look for. And it's like, if you're applying for a job, if you're applying for a position, make sure that there's something in your portfolio that shows that you can do what's required of that position. And, and if you don't particularly have it on your showreel or in your portfolio, do it, make some, you know, you know, get it together. So, and just show some initiative. And because that's what, you know, if it, if an employer is looking for something for you to, to, to apply your skills to a particular role, you need to show that you can do that. Um, I also really, really value somebody who comes with, um, who's a good communicator, who's ready to work with people. You know, I think that, you know, a lot of students, I think collaboration, collaborative projects in a student environment are really, really helpful, like help you work with people. Um, and especially if you, you know, go to a, one of the bigger companies. You're going to be working with a lot of people. Be prepared to learn. You know, you've got to you've got to be prepared to learn all the time. Um, so that's really important. So yeah, so that's 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 kind of what I would look for. N not just the talent. You've got to you've, you know you've got to have people skills. You've got to be able to communicate. You've got to work as a team. Um, be prepared to learn. Um, and yeah, and then reap the rewards. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks. A great answer there, Jackie. And I'd just like to add and let this, the, the people in the audience know that um, uh, we help you with everything that Jackie just mentioned, portfolio development, communication skills, working in collaborative teams. You'll do that at AIT. Um, we place a lot of importance on that. Some of you will have heard about um, the final two semesters at AIT, the FORGE uh, subject. Uh, it's grown over the years. Jackie was actually very instrumental in that particular program in its early days. Um, and uh, it's, it's grown from there. And I think that's helped our students segue into industry. Yeah. So April, I'd love to know from, from your point of view, and then Chris will we'll focus films and then games. What is it, what are those things that you can, um, those little tips you can offer there in this space of? Yeah, I think, um, and I have to speak from the perspective of the kind of business we're in and what we do. And it's for us being able to be open. Well, one, that you could come to the application with diverse skill set. So with a small team that we kind of pretty um, dynamic and mobile, we lean on each other to kind of sometimes fill gaps. So it's almost like you could, you could take the approach of having a certain discipline that you focus on as your main area, but you've got capacity to jump in and support others as well, or you might have some runs on the board um, in that space. Um, our director cinematographer, for example, spends a lot of his time outside of work, making sure he's across the latest technologies or the latest um, industry trends and things like that. I think without a doubt, it's about, it's an industry that it's a hard work. It's not sure there's a little, small portion of it that's got some glamour in it but the rest of it is rolling out your sleeves and being willing to work in a team and co yeah collaborate obviously and also just in the idea like idea making space that people feel like you know they can have a say and contribute um yeah I think other than that um 
I think as well, when recently we, we employed um, an account, a producer and the what really made some of the candidates stand out was when they made, took the, went that extra mile. So it wasn't just the email, it was on the phone finding out more about what we did. The cover letter absolutely identified what about um, what type of work we had produced that resonated with them and why. And then reaching out over the phone and things like this, the old school way. So that kind of meant those applicants went to the top of the pile. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Great. Thanks, April. How about you, Chris? As the, as the last up here, I've had the luxury of being able to like write out some notes as everyone else has been, <laughs> been talking. Uh, so... <laughs> Uh, following on from, from what April said, actually, I think that that discussion of specialization versus generalization can actually present a pretty different portfolio. And it's interesting because the size of your team really can affect where that matters in games. You know, like if you're looking at ending up at a very large studio, then there's a good chance that um, that there's a good chance that outside of your general, um, you know, communication skills and such, when it comes to your straight up development skills, um, they're going to be often looking for someone that's more specialized, you know, because a larger studio can afford to have X number of environmental artists and X number of character artists and an animation programmer or a gameplay programmer or engine programmers. And they're able to actually get these people and actually have them in very clear cut categories. Um, the smaller the team that you're likely to be on, then you're going to have more control over the overall product, but you're also more likely to be more of a generalist because you've got to have to wear a bunch of different hats to kind of get things done. So, don't feel bad if your portfolio seems like it shows that you've got a, a rather general skill set. That's actually a really positive thing in some spaces. And don't feel bad if you're like, oh, but I'm only good at this one thing because there are plenty of teams that often are like, we need that one thing done really well. So that's kind of the first thing I wanted to mention on that front. The next was um, with regards to tips, I mean, asking for tips in, in, in terms of games is a really broad thing. Uh, so I've, I've got a couple of different disciplines. If that's okay, uh, I'll, I'll try to go through them quickly. Um, when it comes to design, uh, my main tip for design is really straightforward. And that is uh, technical design goes a long way. One of the trends I've seen on a personal level in the last couple of years is more and more folks seem to be interested in technical designers. So that is to say, don't just be able to come up with the game design, but be able to kind of flesh that out yourself. Now, you don't need to be a really talented programmer to have the world's best code to test the thing. Um, you can create the world's ugliest implementation of your idea, but it still means that when you go into a conversation with someone about why you think something's a great idea, um, being able to kind of work with those uh, you know, have something tangible that people can tinker with and understand your perspective really, really helps uh, because a lot of folks go into design thinking that their role ends at kind of producing a really large stack of like, here is the specs for everything. Um, but quite often being able to do that somewhat on a technical level helps out a lot. Uh, for programmers, I would strongly suggest um, for your portfolio, being able to look at the difference between being able to develop stuff outright um, versus also being able to work with an existing framework. Uh, an advantage that a lot of people that started in the modding scene have is that they're building stuff on top of an existing game. So they're able to kind of tinker with things that exist to build their own changes to it. That's a really useful skill to have because when you're working as part of a larger team, you need to be able to work with what everyone has, especially if you're ending up on a product that's been, you know, floating around for quite a while. Um, but at the same time, being able to work on that stage of how do these things work at a fundamental level can be really, really beneficial. On the programming side as well, I'd like to flag that, you know, um, if you start to go on the engineering side, the portfolio of stuff that you'll have is very different quite often to the gameplay programming side. Engineering is going to be far more about what you can, can build as tools for other folks to use. Uh, sorry, I'm almost through on just the last couple, I hope that's okay. Um, no, it's great, it's great stuff, thank you. The, on the tech art side, a conceptual understanding of, of what you're changing is really important. I know I just launched into the phrase tech art before without really rigidly defining it, uh, but it's essentially that role that sits between programming and art. Um, that is to say that like conceptually understand that what you're doing could be implied in I mean, many different scenarios. Like if I have a giant death laser that's melting the ground as it moves around and I have a beautiful deer not near the death laser, don't stress, but a beautiful deer walking through like a serene snow field that's leaving tracks in the snow behind it. Uh, from an implementation perspective, those are the same thing. Um, like the death laser and the deer are basically the same thing on a fundamental level. That is to say that there is an object in the world that is changing what the ground looks like 
Uh, so from a tech artist being able to explain that, hey, I can do something and that I can use these as uh, these concepts as tools to develop different kinds of things, fleshes out your portfolio quickly, but it also means that you're understanding it in a, a broader sense, which is really important. Um, and the last one that I wanted to, uh, to, to flag here was on the art side. Just, just be aware of optimization as well as visuals. Uh, we get some, you know, like I've, I've seen plenty of teams um, and plenty of students go through for, you know, working with different teams that they'll have sensational art, um, but they haven't really grasped some of the, the concepts. Like a lot of the stuff that you get taught in the early days of studying game art, it's very easy to, to, to rule out when you start messing with Houdini or start messing with substance or whatever, you know, tool set you want to work with. Um, but a lot of those fundamentals of like good UVing, um, good material setup, uh, proper you know, uh, proper use of things like vertex weighting and color can, can really pay off a lot. And um, being able to show that off in your portfolio is really, really positive. Sorry that that ended up being a mini TED talk. Uh, crammed Mama, into, TED talk. So that response. Mama, TED talk uh, <laughs> Chris, can I just um, say here, would you agree that it's, quality not quantity when putting together anything you want to show to industry or yeah yeah I mean in the same way that like I think I'd, I view it in the same way as a resume right like when you're when you're applying for say you're applying for a job at you know a large game studio somewhere um, when you're putting down your work experience you often won't list the cafe job that you used to do or something like that because of because of relevance right and I think to some extent that can be the same with portfolios you know that is showing off what is really relevant that you don't want them to see something and be like that's great and then see something else and be like oh because if that oh one is from your first year uni and everything else is is a higher grade then you might as well just have just the higher tier stuff if you can if you can do it uh, sometimes <laughs> taking a scalpel to your portfolio is can be pretty useful that's good. Does it, do any of you um, want to add to that, um, Mark, April, Jackie? Yeah, I think that uh, I completely agree. I'm, besides agreeing with Chris on that, I'm like kind of, I'm going to have to chat to you later, Chris. I'd love you to come and talk to, to us at Flying Bark about Unreal and, and, and integrating that sort of uh, real-time rendering process into the pipelines that we've got. We, we talk about it, but we never seem to take the step there. Um, and it'll revolu revolutionize things, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, just, um, you know, in terms of portfolios and things like that, yeah, put your best foot forward always, always. You know, if you feel like, I mean, I'm the kind of person who likes to see scribbles and sketches as well, you know, so I, it gives me a bit of, a bit more insight into what you, you can do. But obviously if it's that scribbles and sketches still need to show something, they just show, your, show, show an ability. So um, for sure, I think that, um, um, honing your your portfolio to be the best it can and as i said if you if for whatever you position you're applying for make sure it's appropriate for that and that brings me jackie that very point to a question that blake in the chat room had i saw it come up mentioned 2d and vfx but what about my 3d work hmm. well blake uh julie do you want to read out that question so i got it right yeah sure thanks tomorrow um, so Blake asked, what if my portfolio consists of two 2D animations, plenty of VFX, but a few 3D renders? Mm -hmm. Would my folio as described be applicable for the 3D animation courses? So perhaps Blake was actually asking that more towards um, okay. the student enrollment advisors. Oh. But actually, now I've just got a bit of bit of time. There's been a couple of questions that thank you, Mark and April have answered already, but two very similar questions about um, you know, mature aged people and um, you know wondering if they can um, still be considered for work in these industries and you guys have um, greatly answered those yeah. questions for them but I just thought it might be worth opening that up to everyone regarding you know people who are concerned that they might be too to? old or to, oh, to work within. I can tell you right industry. now that at Flying Bark we have people from the age of like I don't know probably 19, 18 or 19, all the way up to 60 working at the studio. And I don't think that there's any, it's all to do with skill and, and how you communicate, how you work as a team. And, and, and if you've got a passion for your work, it shows, it doesn't matter what age you are, I'm living proof. <laughs> 
I think I'll just jump in there. I think that's one of the best parts about the industry that you do get to work with people from all of all ages and backgrounds. And it just makes it such a rich experience when you're doing that. And the example I spoke to in the chat before was that we're working on a feature film and both it's a co-written piece of a true story that happened to them, you know, 20 years ago. But both of those writers are in their late 60s. And, you know, obviously we're being optimistic to say that this film will go all the way to the big screen or whatever version of the screen. But, you know, that's their first feature. They've had other creative backgrounds and experiences in life. And now they've made this script come to life. And we had a script read this week. We heard the actors speak the words back after 20 years of work. And it was a really profound experience. And as I say, those ladies are both in their 60s. So that's kind of a very relevant example to give at the moment. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much, both of you, for, for uh, reiterating that. Because um, it's... We're all learning, whatever our job is. And if we decide to go back to uni or study career change at whatever age, we are very fortunate to have that opportunity. So, sure. excellent, excellent. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit more about a few more tips and, and, and tricks, etc. cetera. Um, just, so what are your views on what is so critical when studying and preparing for careers in your industries? Just a couple of off the top, all of you, uh, tips while students are still, you know, at whatever college, university, and they're about to embark. Oh, we, we, I, when I, whenever we talk to, I guess, the course leaders, the some students tend to come out of high school and then treat the, the, the course as if it's still high school, you know, like that kind of, but that, that, is your, that is your foundation of going on to working in the industry. So to take it as seriously as you can and work as hard as you can, because that's when you create the stuff that Chris and Jackie were talking about, the stuff that you'll build a little reel from. And if you're doing those, if you've, as as Jackie said, if you if you're really passionate about rigging, for instance, then do the little rigging projects on the side and let show the show the inner workings of a of a particular model and show how you've built the rigs in your in your showreel. And always as as Chris kind of was saying, trim it to the point where it it looks a, a small amount of really good stuff and put it towards the front of, of mm. the showreel as well, because especially in, in Alt-DFX, it was kind of my role for a few years to just review every showreel that came in. And you would know like, within Seconds. a minute. Yeah, or a minute, you'd give, give it a minute, and you'd know, ah, yeah, this might not work. Or, you know, there's something in there. Mm. And know who to pass it to in the company to get their kind of, from a, a, a leads opinion on it so yeah i completely agree with mark it's like your study is your opportunity to like you know follow what it is that you want to do um and having done some teaching myself it, you know it, it's frustrating to see some students who as you say treat, treat it like school and they don't take it seriously and i don't know whether it's because they're not paying the bill <laughs> but um you know it's it really is um, your opportunity to like get that stepping stone because that's that's what study is. It's a stepping stone. It's it it's not it does not guarantee you of a job, um, but what it does is it gives you a foundation for, on which you can start building your career, um, and at the same time develop things on the side. You know, use all your spare time to start making something that can become if it's not part of a project that you uh, um, in your course that you're doing. Do other stuff as well. I mean, I really do believe that one of the biggest stepping stones for a, any career in a creative industry, well, in, a, in an animation and film, is a short film, to make a short film and to make it the best thing you can possibly do. I mean, there's lots of people who've like really kicked off their careers by making a short film that's just, you know, even if it's really short, that just showcases some skills, some fantastic storytelling, new ideas, creativity, uh, all of those things that, um, you know, people look for when they want to work with you. Yeah, I think I think definitely treating um, treating school as a starting point for for your portfolio. Like, 
aggressively putting time into that that final year project and treating any assignment that's going to have some sort of output as something that someone might actually see and look at one day yeah. really really means a lot and it means a bit more time spent on those assignments now means you're not actually going to then have to produce a ton of extra portfolio work when you finish school because you're like oh actually now i need to like revise and do all these again um yeah i mean like i i was the final year project that I did for uni really like I, I sunk a lot of time into to really aggressively use as something that I could use as a platform for other things. Um, but the other piece of advice I'd give on that front is throughout you like throughout your studies, whenever you can polish something up, do your best to polish it up. Uh, even if it's touching on some of the fields that you're not generally familiar with, you know, like if you make a really cool animation, putting that animation in a nice environment that's nicely lit. Uh, and spending that little bit of extra time can be a really, really nice way to just force yourself to understand the rest of it from a holistic perspective. And that can have a lot of knock on benefits uh, later on when you're looking for a job. Also, if you're trying to figure out what you want to do with your life. <laughs> so Lily, out... Chris uh, and Jackie, April, Mark, would you, um, would you advise uh, emerging talent to maybe reach out to um, you know, an industry practitioner they've admired. We bring a lot of people, practitioners into AIT. Um, maybe reach out to them, ask, take them for a coffee, maybe ask them to look at your work. Um, don't overburden them, of course, but <laughs> you know, you're busy people. But would you, would you suggest something like that when, when they're sort of in their later semesters, perhaps? Yeah. But just, just from my perspective, you know, um, if working at Flying Bark at the moment, I mean, I am, you know, sort of happy to chat to anybody and look at what, what they do. Flying Bark does have an internship and they do have sort of like a, a, a path, a channel to follow to, to do that. Um, but I'm always open to, to chatting to people and seeing what they're up to, for sure. And I think the other thing is as well, we've all been there ourselves. And yeah. something I touched on a little bit earlier is like, just knock on the doors. That might be the same, similar to what Tamara's describing. Someone will say yes, someone will have that cuppa with you and have that chat and, you know, um, we all need mentors and the more networking you can do, the better. Definitely. I would actually encourage not doing it at the end of your final year. If you can do it, doing it just before your final year. Because um, one really frustrating thing with reaching out to mentors in the industry, especially, is like, if, there's a good chance the advice they're going to give you is how to treat your final year. And a really frustrating thing for a student is to be told that the last year you spent, you probably should have spent it in a slightly different way. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like if you've just gone through your final year and you're like, all right, I want a job now. I want to start talking to industry. And then industry is like, make sure you do this in your last year. You're going to be like, oh, wait. Uh, so uh, there is definitely a sweet spot for that time. I, I know because like every now and then I give people some like advice and they're like, that'll take some time. And I'm like, yeah, this would have been good six months ago. Uh, so, uh, there's, there's even a, just following on from that, Chris, there was a, a, a little kid called Adam who he was actually just up and he was living in Melbourne, but he was up in Sydney for two weeks and he just appeared at the front gate one day. <laughs> but he died, it turned out he had emailed the one of our producers because they were distant cousins or friends or something. And the, he got passed to me. It was like, hey, he didn't even have, he was just kind of starting his course. And then I sh showed him around, showed him some showreels and talked about what, what it is we do. And then about a year ago, he, he emailed me saying, hey, I've just, fin I've just finished this, my final year film. Do you want to have a look? He wasn't even applying for any jobs. He was just kind of keeping in contact saying, hey, this is what I've been up to. And as soon as I watched it, I picked up the phone and said, do, do you want a job? Because <laughs> we, we were looking for a, a, someone to come on as a, a junior lighting artist. And within, within two weeks, he was on a plane up to Brisbane to start his professional career. And it was just, just purely, he was just his own initiative to just maintain contact with the people that he'd met along his journey. And it just hit at the exact right time f for us and for him. Brilliant. What a great, uh, great little story. Um, we do encourage our students to do just that. And what I tell our students as well is 
um, people in the creative technologies are super generous. Mm. Um, they really like emerging talent. They're not seeing emerging talent as competition. They want to nurture that talent, bring them up, potentially even mentor them. So, as April said, you know, we've all been there before. So we yeah. really, really know what it's like <laughs> when you're trying to trying to get something off the ground. Yeah. Great advice from all of you. Thank you. Are there any questions, um, Julia, that we can um, uh, sort of finish off with that we've got in the chat room? You're Ooh. muted, <laughs> uh, Julia. Sorry, guys. Gosh, got to the end of the day and then I forgot to unmute. Oh, I, want to you. <laughs> I was just saying we've actually um, we've gone through all, all the all the questions so far. Um, so yeah, just another shout out to anyone listening. Um, if you have any other questions, please just type them in now. Um, but um, other than that, we we don't have any more at the moment. Do you mind if I answer one that has popped up? That's okay. I can see uh, for it, for uh, someone asked about if they're a year 11 student, what could they do uh, to prepare themselves for, is, is, if you don't mind? Um, I would strongly recommend uh, brushing up a bit on your vector math. Um, uh, looking a bit into the type of math that goes into uh, game development can really, really give you a head start on the programming side. Uh, it's funny because like these days I work with a lot of folks who think that I must have been like straight A student in high school when it came to like my, my math knowledge. The truth is, is that once my, once I stopped looking at that same math as when will the boat pass the fisherman and instead what angle do I need to shoot a rocket to take out blue team? Um, <laughs> I cared way more about one of them than the other and high school was giving me the first one and uni was giving me the latter. So, um, you know, that, that once you have an interest in doing game development, understand that a lot of the really boring math that you're looking at in, in, in high school probably actually now has a time and a place to do some really weird stuff and some really cool stuff. And if you can knock some of that out now, then game programming becomes far more about understanding just the instructions of doing what you want to do than having to necessarily understand the complicated uh, surroundings of passing that information through various actors in the scene. Wonderful, Chris, that's that's great advice for students. Um, yeah, what they're learning at school now may actually swim into focus in other areas when they're, you know, when their studies continue into the area that they're so passionate about. So absolutely. I but guess, one... sorry, Joanna, it's just, I, I guess I want to, it's also just as you go through your course, like be prepared to, suddenly discover that you I think Jackie said it up, up front too, that so be suddenly prepared to be doing something that you didn't intend to be doing. A lot of people come in saying, oh, I want to be, I want to do this, I want to do that. But then they suddenly find themselves as a, a compositor or a, a, a lighter or a, a junior rigger or, or, or such like. And I think it's good that Chris is on the, the panel too, because as well as those traditional VFX tools that, that we use, the, the team at Tada, the technology company, are, are using all of those skills that they, they honed in the traditional BFX pipelines and bringing them to something like Unreal and then creating new and interactive experiences using a whole combination of the, the different skills that they've learned and the, the powerful new technology. Like, and really creating characters and creating basically animations that would have taken a traditional animation pipeline maybe a couple of weeks to do and they can do what 20 30 iterations in the, in the matter of a few days so it's kind of just being aware of what the, I guess what Chris is doing a good job be, being aware of what the advances of that technology is going on because it, it, it is changing a lot of people's out, outlook in terms of photoreal visual effects Chris would probably disagree but I'd, I don't know if it's 100% there yet, but it's certainly it's getting closer. <laughs> it's, get, it's, certainly, it's certainly getting there. Wow. Um, guys, thank you so much for being with us on a beautiful Saturday. <laughs> um, look, look uh, passing on these insights and advice and tips is just so important for, for, for you know, emerging talent, embarking on that next step. Um, you know, here at college, we can say all sorts of things, but when they hear it from industry, 
you know, from 2D animation, 3D animation, VFX and games and film, it's gold. Mm. So thank you for your generosity. Uh, we totally appreciate you being here. And um, there were some more questions. We've got to finish up now, but they can come through to Julia and the team. And um, yeah, it's been it's been lovely hearing from all of you. Thanks so much. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Okay, all right. Well, as Tamara mentioned, it's been fantastic having you guys um, as part of our industry guest speakers today. So thank you very much for all, all, to all of you for, um, for coming along today. And um, we're going to wrap up, but I just wanted to, again, just extend a big thank you to everyone that's taken part, our teachers, um, Tamara, obviously, um, all of our awesome graduates. And, um, and our industry panelists. So yeah, we hope everyone who's out there listening and watching is uh, or has had a fantastic day and uh, enjoyed listening to all of these wise words from everyone. And um, just a reminder, we do have this recorded, so we will send that out to you. Um, if you've missed this particular session, don't worry, it will all be um, sent to you on your email. So again, once again, thank you very much, everyone. And um, we'll hopefully see you all soon. Goodbye. Bye, Jackie, Mark, Chris, Bye -bye. April, and everyone. Yes, Mara.